What? What? What the... what? I dare say, might there be a fungus among us? My partner Eric, who is a veritable fun guy, <clears throat> spends a lot of time trying to identify all the bizarre mushrooms on the farm. When you start to notice, the diversity of their colors and shapes and sizes is amazing. It's not really any different for the plants and the animals. And as we're learning how to support the biodiversity on our property, we spend a lot of time studying the visual properties of the things around us, especially their colors and sizes and details of their shapes. Even if the relationships between organisms may be encoded on a deeper level in invisible structures like DNA, their outward visible properties are still the main way that we tell them apart. But vision is such a specific, macroscopic form of sensing. It requires a lot of light that bounces off of an object, and then gets sensed in a special apparatus like an eye or a camera. The same sort of sensing doesn't work for basic particles, basic quanta. The concepts of shape, size, and color just don't translate on that scale. So on what basis do we even tell these particles apart? This chart, which we've now seen a few times, contains some information about the properties that physicists use to tell the fundamental particles apart, and indeed to define them through their differences. It doesn't show information about all of the properties, but it gives information about three of the most important ones, mass, charge, and spin. These three properties do relate to things that we can experience on a macroscopic scale. They don't relate to the macroscopic properties of color, shape, or size, at least not directly, but there are behaviors of macroscopic materials that emerge as a direct result of the microscopic properties of the particles within them. Like with mass, an object with more atoms in it, or more massive atoms in it, will manifest as macroscopically heavier and harder to move than an object with comparatively fewer or less massive atomic components. Electric charge can also manifest on a macroscopic scale. Microscopically, electric charge is a property that some particles have, like electrons, but some don't, like neutrinos. There are two varieties which are arbitrarily labeled positive and negative. We can get a macroscopic feeling for the forces that charged particles exert on one another by experimenting with static electricity. Here we can see that a staticky balloon attracts some materials, but not others. And two balloons that have both been rubbed with wool will repel each other. These macroscopic effects come about because the friction of the balloon surface against the wool tends to deposit extra electrons on the surface of the balloon. So here we're seeing, on a macroscopic scale, electrons repelling electrons. The macroscopic effects of magnetism also relate to the electric charge of the microscopic components in a material. But in addition, they depend on the microscopic property of spin. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But first I just want to highlight that a magnet interacts in a different way with materials than a static balloon. Certain objects, which we call magnets, permanently maintain the ability to interact magnetically. This is ultimately because of microscopic alignments of the spins of the many particles within them. And while magnetic effects are clearly different from electric effects, for example, these magnets are not charged and won't affect feathers or hair or bits of paper like a static balloon would, the forces that magnets can exert on one another are similar in their ability to either attract or repel. You know by now to be suspicious of any drawings meant to represent quanta. But just to help make sense of the concept of spin, imagine that at the center of each of these loops there is a single electron, and that the direction of the arrow refers to the electron physically spinning. That idea is where we got the terminology of spin in the first place. And while we can't actually say that electrons are truly spinning, again because they just don't behave in such a straightforward way, their spin does result in them carrying angular momentum, which is a measure, in a way, of some kind of rotational motion. And it's exactly the angular momentum of charged particles that leads to what we call magnetism. Each electron, because of its spin, acts like a tiny magnet. And like macroscopic magnets, the orientation matters. We might label the electron with a direction corresponding to the so-called north pole of its magnetic effect, with a corresponding so-called south magnetic pole in the opposite direction. Or, to abbreviate the idea that spin and magnetism have a direction or orientation in space, often the concept of spin is just illustrated with arrows. If there are many spins within a material that are all lined up to point in the same direction, that can result in the macroscopic behavior we associate with a magnet, like a refrigerator magnet or a magnetic toy. So to summarize this bit, the microscopic properties of mass, charge, and spin, at least for the up quarks and down quarks and electrons in ordinary matter, do have direct macroscopic effects. They govern how hard objects are to move and how they behave electrically and magnetically. In general, we can say that any property we associate with a particle is a way that it behaves differently from other particles. Some such differences define the particles, like how the defining difference between pins and needles is that needles have a hole in one end, while pins have a flat or round part that we call the head. 
With respect to those defining properties, we expect every single particle of the same kind to be identical. And we find that they are. Every electron is exactly identical to every other electron in its defining properties. Quanta are actually much more perfect in their sameness than any collection of similar macroscopic objects, like these pins, each of which probably varies a tiny bit from the others in some way. Another interesting feature of quantum scale properties is the empirical fact that the universe seems to be populated with sets of particles that we can describe as having opposite properties, like opposite charge. This is shown here by the three columns labeled as matter, in contrast to the three columns labeled as antimatter. While they may not be as common, we found that for every type of particle we've ever discovered, we can find a type that we call its antiparticle. If the particle is negatively charged, the antiparticle will be positively charged, and vice versa. But all the vocabulary around antiparticles, like the words positive and negative, or the concept that they're intrinsically opposite, it's all a little bit loaded. I mean, so is the contrast of black versus white, as if those are intrinsically opposite as well. The numbers that we give to properties like charge, like how we label an electron as having a charge of minus one, and we label its antiparticle, a positron, as having a charge of plus one, those labels are arbitrary. And in a way, we're using the relationship between positive and negative numbers as a metaphor or a representation for something that we've empirically discovered about how charge works. When you combine together equal positive and negative numbers, you get zero. Similarly, when we combine together equal amounts of positive and negative charge, we get something that acts like it has no charge. This is how whole atoms and things that are made up of whole atoms generally act like they have no charge at all, even if they're made up of things that do. And we also discover, empirically, that merging together a particle with its antiparticle gives you nothing at all. Well, not exactly nothing. But the two particles disappear, leaving only light. We call this, in physics, annihilation. Again, a little loaded. Maybe we just need some different metaphors. Um, you know, here's my lawn. I've been doing a lot of digging lately, and it's an unavoidable fact that every hole I dig comes along with a corresponding pile of dirt, and vice versa. Maybe we should think about the particles and antiparticles more like holes and piles than like entities that are in opposition. And then maybe it makes sense that merging them back together you get some kind of a neutral state. But what am I saying? That lawns are neutral? They're totally not neutral. The American lawn is an ecological catastrophe, which is why delawnifying is one of my major fall projects. Okay, anyway, the point is, we should reflect on the vocabulary that we use when we describe particles, because a lot of it can be loaded and it's based on metaphors. Now, back to talking about the specific properties associated with the different particles in this chart. So far, I've emphasized properties we might call intrinsic, like mass, charge, and spin. For a given particle, these properties are definite, they're even defining. But those are not the only kinds of properties particles can have, just like the identifying property of having a head rather than a hole isn't the only thing you can say about these pins. We might also, for example, notice that the individual pins are in different places and pointed in different directions. Likewise, if we have individual electrons moving around in an environment, they may all have identical intrinsic properties, but they might have different positions, different momentums, different orientations of their spins. And it's these configurational properties that are subject to quantum weirdness, the kind of stuff that we've talked about previously, like wave-particle duality, as showcased in the double-slit experiment. Configurational properties like location, momentum, and orientation of spin are not well-defined for quanta the same way that the configuration of a set of pins on a table can be well-defined. And there's another important level of describing the properties of particles at the level of a system. Like in this system of sewing supplies, I have 19 pins and 3 needles. For particles, the system-level properties might be the total number of particles of each type, the total momentum, total angular momentum, or the total energy which leads us to dun, 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 conservation laws. I hate that these are called laws. It seems to me that the universe has some rules. We give those rules the very loaded, again, name of laws. Those rules govern system-level properties. For example, if we have a bounded system of particles, the total amount of momentum, angular momentum, and energy in that system doesn't ever seem to be able to change. So if one particle loses energy, for example, this has to be balanced out by another particle gaining energy, and so on. These things we call conservation laws do reflect empirically verified patterns in how the universe works. But as always, we need to be careful with concepts like balance. We tend to load those concepts with metaphorical and moral significance and then confuse ourselves about whether the significance has some important connection to the natural world itself. Like, people often think that balance is an intrinsically good thing. But is balance a concept given to us by the universe, or a concept we impose upon the universe? If we see something that seems to obey a type of balance in nature, is it always intrinsically good? Do we expect nature or the universe to either define or obey rules, even laws, that are laden with those kinds of values, 
All right, I don't want to get too carried away here, but the main thing I wanted to do is point out that there are differences in the types of properties we might assign to a particle or a system of particles. And I already pointed out that the configurational properties are where we find the quantum weirdness, like how quanta in the double slit experiment may not have a well-defined position at all times. Moreover, there are some configurational properties that seem to have a relationship of complementarity with other properties. What this word means is that they can't be made to be definite at the same time. Famously, position and momentum are like that. The more definite the position of a quantum entity, the less definite its momentum, and vice versa. This kind of linked indefiniteness between two properties, like position and momentum, is sometimes given the name the uncertainty principle in quantum physics. But rather than get hung up on all the vocabulary, here's a metaphor based on some of my own personal psychological hang-ups. Imagine that somebody asks me two questions. One question is, do you like doing yarn crafts? And the other question is, what's your gender identity? Those questions for me, personally, obey a kind of uncertainty principle. I will answer them differently if you ask them in different orders. And answering one question evidently has an effect on the answer to the other. Absent a specific context, neither question has a singularly clear answer for me. But one thing that is clear to me is I really dislike being identified with the stereotype of a crafty lady. Honestly, that's really stupid, but that's just one of my hangs. What it ends up meaning is that if you ask me first to identify my gender, Maybe I'll say I identify as female. But then because I'm thinking about gender, if you next ask me about yarn crafts, I'm likely to be vague and non-committal about whether I like them or not. On the flip side, if you first ask me whether I like yarn crafts, I might say no or I might say yes based on my mood. But then quite likely whatever I say will influence my answer to the second question about gender identity. If I said no to the yarn question, I'm more likely to say I identify as female. But if I said yes, I'm more likely to mumble something non-committal about how I would really like to be seen as non-binary. The point is that measuring either of these so-called properties of my personality and identity has an effect on the other, and neither of them is definite until you make me answer the question. Of course, that's all a metaphor. It's not even a particularly good metaphor for the way that position and momentum work, or the way that there's uncertainty between the different orientations of spin. And the same logic doesn't apply uniformly to all people. It's not like there's a universal uncertainty principle between yarn craft tendencies and gender. But the uncertainty principle about position and momentum does apply uniformly to all quanta. And there are other uncertainty principles, having to do with energy and having to do with spin, that apply to all quanta. But okay, the last thing that I want to do in this video is point out that when you combine the quantum weirdness for configurational properties with the conservation rules that apply for systems, then things get even weirder. So let's take this box, for example, and imagine that it contains our quantum system. And let's say that it's a system that just involves two particles. And those particles are going to be symbolized by some tomatoes. And I'm going to use the colors and shapes of those tomatoes to metaphorically represent configurational properties, like the direction of spin or the momentum of each particle. Suppose that I prepare my quantum system inside the mushroom box so that my two particles are different in both color and in shape. But meanwhile, the particles themselves are free to behave randomly and indeterminately the way that quanta do. What kinds of things might we see if we open the box? Well, maybe we could see a yellow pear-shaped tomato and a red round one. But if we did the experiment again, we might instead see a green round one and a yellow pear-shaped one. Or if we did the experiment again, maybe we see a green pear-shaped tomato and a red round one. When the box is closed, somehow all of these possibilities coexist at the same time. The system level property, that the shapes and colors must be different, holds firm and unchanging, at the same time as allowing for the individual particles to be indeterminate, randomly manifesting one of the many possibilities when measured. And what happens if you take the parts of such a system and you separate them? Do they keep their links? And then what happens if you measure just one of them? What do you know, or what don't you know about the other? For example, we find that one of them is pear-shaped in yellow. What does that mean about the tomato in the other hand? Okay, all of this is to serve as an introduction to something called quantum entanglement, but we're not gonna go there yet. I'll do that in the next video because right now, all these tomatoes are making me hungry and it's time for lunch. 